I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it is a landmark moment in the history of these things. But I struggle to I struggle to equate that with justice. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November twelfth, two thousand twenty-one. You could be forgiven if you had forgotten about the existence of Majid Khan, who pled guilty in a military commission at Guantanamo eight years ago, but he has been back in the news of late. At a sentencing hearing recently at Guantanamo, he gave graphic testimony about his torture and treatment at the hands of the CIA and the military. He also took responsibility and showed remorse for his own conduct. His speech in the military commission was sufficiently moving that several members of the jury wrote a letter to the convening authority asking for clemency for Majid Khan. To talk about the dramatic events, the history of the case, and the CIA program's treatment of Majid Khan, I was joined in the Virtual Jungle Studio this week by Michelle Paradis, longtime friend of Lawfare and appellate lawyer for the Office of Military Commission's Defense Counsel. We talked about what Majid Khan did, his history in Al-Qaeda after a childhood in Baltimore. We talked about what was done to him, and we talked about whether with all this water under the bridge... Something like justice could ever come from a trial. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 12th. Michel Paradis on Majid Khan. So, Michel, for those in the audience for whom the name doesn't mean anything, who is Majid Khan? So, Majid Khan is a Pakistani refugee who came to the United States in the mid-1990s with his family, grew up in the outskirts of Baltimore, had a very typical uh, American high school upbringing, certainly, uh, you know, for any immigrant. As he described it, he used to smoke pot and run around with girls whenever he had the opportunity. And graduated from high school, found himself probably a little bit lost. Again, this is sort of based on his own description, but I think there's a lot to it. You know, got a a good job in IT in, in Virginia, and had a bit of a crisis um, when his mother died in uh, 2001, in the spring of 2001. And according to him, and I, again, I think there's every reason to to credit his descriptions of his own path, this increasingly led him to uh, you know seek meaning in his life, and where he found that meaning was jihad. And this was you know in 2001, early 2002, he begins to become more radicalized. Uh, There are, you know, influences that he has both, you know, family and local that I think certainly directed him in that direction. And then he goes to Pakistan in uh, early 2002 and meets individuals, including Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. And that really does put him on a path to becoming a much more, at least aspiring operational character in Al Qaeda. And for much of the next year, he he does a number of things uh, at the behest of Al Qaeda until he's captured in uh, 2003, and then taken to the CIA's detention, rendition, and interrogation program. There he disappears, as most uh, as most everyone else did, until he resurfaces in Guantanamo as one of the high-value detainees in 2006. And that is essentially the beginning of the legal saga uh, that has surrounded his case really now for the past 15 years. So why are we talking about him today? He's been... Uh at Guantanamo pretty quietly since he showed up there in September of 2006. I was at his plea hearing uh, the first time, not not physically, but I was at the remote site to which it was simulcast. I forget what year that was at Fort Meade. It was 2012 or 2013. Yeah, I think it was early in the history of Lawfare. I covered it live for Lawfare, his plea hearing before the military commission. And yet, we all, some of us thought that was the end of the saga. You know, here, here he was, he, in his uh, accentless American English, pleading guilty. And that turned out not to be the end of the story. Lo, these many years later, Majid Khan is back in the news. Why? 
So his path really is sort of both bizarre in the ordinary sense, unremarkable in the Guantanamo sense, and really kind of proving to be a really interesting inflection point in the history of these military commissions. So he, as you mentioned, pleads guilty to a variety of essentially facilitation charges in the military commission, including, you know, serious charges. I'm not gainsaying those, including uh, um, helping to transfer money to as part of a plot to bomb the JW Marriott. Uh, which killed 11 people, as, as well as another plot to um, attempt to assassinate Pervez Musharraf. And so these are serious crimes, but he pleads guilty, uh, agrees to cooperate with the government, and uh, really for the next eight years, through fairly routine but behind-the-scenes litigation, his defense team are trying to set the stage and find the parameters for what his sentencing hearing will ultimately be like. Because in the military commission system, uh, which is modeled on parts of the military justice system, even if you plead guilty, you actually have a full-blown sentencing hearing um, that is decided by a jury, as opposed to what most people might be familiar with in the federal system, where a judge, based on the sentencing guidelines, will typically uh, sentence you alone. And so in Majid Khan's case, they spent much of the past eight, nine years uh, negotiating what exactly that sentencing hearing will look like to include the central mitigating fact that his lawyers wanted to put forward, which was the fact that while in CIA custody, uh, and indeed while in Defense Department custody in Guantanamo, he was subjected to pretty extreme illegal forms of torture and abuse. And there's really no, you know, sugarcoating that. The, The allegations that are uncontested by the government and confirmed by other government documents include everything from the things that many law firm readers might have been familiar with, such as beatings, sleep deprivation, forced nudity, the various uses of water, not technically waterboarding, I suppose, but the uses of water as a way of drowning an individual or convincing that person they're going to be drowned, to submerging him in ice baths, to uh, completely unauthorized improvisations, such as forcible sodomy that was used on a pretty routine basis against Mr. Khan, as well as um, a number of the other detainees who were held in the CIA black sites. And one of the primary bones of contention between military commission prosecutors and Mr. Khan's defense lawyers in negotiating what the defense could present at that sentencing hearing was whether or not they could call witnesses. That was a point of, as you might imagine, high contention. Uh, The litigation on that spanned years. Um, The military judge presiding over the case actually granted Mr. Khan some ability to call CIA officers as witnesses to testify about what happened to him in the black sites. But essentially, as in, in the negotiations around uh, Mr. Khan's plea deal, a, an agreement was cut so that no CIA agents would be called to testify, but uh, Mr. Khan would be able to stand up and make a unsworn statement where he could describe what happened to him without uh, the government objecting or contesting the evidence and essentially creating an adversarial Uh, hearing around what precisely happened. Pause there, because you've just put a huge amount on the table. Before we go further, we should clarify a couple of things uh, in the way of disclosure. And the first is that one member of Majid Khan's defense team is now Lawfare's executive editor, Natalie Orpet. She has never been both at the same time, but she... uh, did work on the Majid Khan case for a long time and now works for us. Natalie, of course, played no role in the preparation of either questions or answers on this podcast. So I suppose we should be uh, frank about that. The second matter is that you are not a member of the Majid Khan defense team, but you are, you do work for the Office of Military Commission Defense Uh, where you do appellate work. So explain the relationship between between your office and the Majid Khan defense and any of the machinations uh, over the last bunch of years. Have you played any role in this or are you just a bystander? So yes, that is a very important point for me to get out. I have no direct or indirect relationship with Majid Khan's defense team. I do work on some of the other detainees' cases and so, therefore, I can't speak or shouldn't and have no ability to speak uh, on or about Mr. Khan's case on his behalf. 
And I should mention that at least one of the cases in which I am counsel in a habeas capacity has a glancing, has sort of some glancing interaction with Mr. Khan's case. So that's just to put all of my cards on the table. I, I don't think I have an adverse relationship to Mr. Khan necessarily, or my client does. But nevertheless, I, I do think it's important to get all of that out. So I think that's right. But our office, I should say, answer to your question, is like any, you know, like a federal public defender, um, but that is specific to the Guantanamo detainees. So Mr. Khan's defense team was made up of both members of our office who were uh, military attorneys, by and large, uh, and civilian attorneys, as well as outside counsel, including uh, from the Center for Constitutional Rights and other law firms, uh, such as Natalie. All right. So let's talk about these eight years of litigation between the plea and the sentencing hearing. We do not normally think about an eight-year gap between a plea and a sentencing. I assume some of that gap was a function of the fact that he was, in fact, cooperating and did cooperate. And so the sentencing hearing was deferred for the period of his cooperation. Is that fair? Oh, that's correct. A big part of his plea agreement, as I understand it um, from the public records, is that he cooperated with the government, both, I think, involving other military commission cases, maybe other federal cases as well. And so a lot of what has been happening over the past eight years is his you know, cooperating with investigators. Um, how much of that continued for the entirety of the eight years, I, I have no insight into, frankly. It's not clear. I do know that uh, his sentencing was originally scheduled to happen at least five years ago initially and has continually been uh, rescheduled and pushed further and further down the road. Precisely why that was, I think, is open to speculation. Well, we can say that of this eight years, at least three of it is explained by the fact that he's actively involved in helping stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. But there's some period of, it's definitely not months, but years that is eaten up by what is essentially litigation over how much of the CIA program is going to be revealed in the context of sentencing. Is that, is that fair? So I think it is fair to say that a lot of the time that has elapsed between when his plea was entered almost a decade ago and his finally getting sentenced a couple of weeks ago um, has been taken up by litigation over what that sentencing hearing will look like, um, how much of the information that his lawyers have been privy to, which is probably still quite classified regarding his treatment in CIA custody, can be disclosed to the, uh, the jury that will ultimately be sentencing him. A major point of contention that I know took a number of years to litigate and resolve was whether or not any CIA officers could be called to testify about what happened and if they were going to be called to testify, under what circumstances they would testify. And that's, you know, something that is unique to Guantanamo. I, you know, you don't, I'm, I'm sure you see very small versions of these kinds of debates in ordinary federal courts, but this debate over how much the detainees are able to learn about their time in CIA custody, how much they'll be able to use that information either in the in the case in chief or in sent, for sentencing purposes has been the single largest proportion of litigation directly and indirectly um, that has happened in these cases. And it's why, for example, the 9-11 case, here we are a decade after it restarted during the Obama administration, and we're nowhere near a trial date. And that's almost entirely because of this snail's pace, literally line by line litigation over what kinds of information the defense can have access to about the CIA's program and what kind of evidence they can use uh, in the context of these trials. Just to clarify, I, I don't want to get off on the sort of broader question of military commissions versus federal courts, because I, I that's a whole separate issue. But how different would that question be if we were in federal district court somewhere? You would still have the same program, the same background, the same treatment, and presumably roughly the same discovery, scope of discovery questions. Is this a creature where the structure of the military commission is really playing a deleterious role? Or is this really a question about the 
substance of the activity having fucked up the case and the case is, you know, happens to be being fought out in a military commission, but you'd have substantially the same issues if you dealt with them in a federal district court somewhere. So I think your second point is definitely true. And you would have very complicated questions to be dealt with in any any time these cases were tried, and, and they would be difficult. The military commissions process do make that process a lot more cumbersome and difficult in a couple of ways that I can just quickly itemize. One is the the military commission prosecutors simply do not have the same, for lack of a better word, bureaucratic pull that U.S. attorneys have. And any U.S. attorney you talk to who's done terrorism cases will confirm that because when they have conversations with the intelligence community about what kind of information can be disclosed, how it can be disclosed, how it can be used under the Classified Information Procedures Act, not only do their phone calls get immediately returned, but they have a lot of leverage in those negotiations to make sure that the information that that the court is requiring gets produced in a timely way. And that's just not the case with the military commissions in Guantanamo. That's not a personal attack on any of the prosecutors, but it is simply the fact that the, the standard operating procedure that the military commission prosecutors have operated under is a zero ground given disclosure strategy. And the, and I think that is largely at the behest of the intelligence community who basically does not feel the same need to bend on its equities when dealing with military commission prosecutors that it would with the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, for example. Just to clarify, is that because of the fact that the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York is a you know, presidentially appointed Senate confirmed official who speaks for the attorney general, who is a cabinet member, whereas the chief prosecutor of the military commissions, however fine an individual he may be, clearly does not speak for the secretary of defense. Absolutely. And so that just that process alone, what you just described, not only makes the requests that, for example, the office of chief to prosecutor would in good faith make. Again, I'm not accusing anyone of bad faith. I'm saying if they request, they say the defense and the military commission has ordered X, Y, or Z information. If that request went to the Southern District of New York, they would basically be able to pick the phone up and directly get the equity holder to answer that question uh, and negotiate. Whereas in the military commission context, that decision has to go up numerous steps of essentially bureaucratic review and then come back through numerous steps of bureaucratic review, which not only dilutes the force of the request, but creates time and takes time and lots of delay. So I think that's one piece of it. I think another piece of it is, and this is prosaic, but I think you can't ignore it, is that the fact that these military commissions are conducted in Guantanamo means that you're only ever going to have hearings in these cases, you know, every couple of months, sometimes much less. And every time, because every time you have a hearing, it becomes this sort of Shit show is the technical. Term. I believe shit show is the is the technical term that Congress has used. But is it you know it's it's an incredibly expensive endeavor. It's essentially you have to quickly create a small town in Guantanamo for a single one off uh, event that's going to take maybe a week or two. You have to fly literally hundreds of people down to Guantanamo, uh, provide them food, lodging, care, keys to cars, everything on this sort of rotating constantly sort of ad hoc basis on a remote island that is on all other sides surrounded by a nation that is not especially friendly to us. And so you can only ever have hearings in which you can litigate questions every, say, three months. And so every question that gets litigated takes at a minimum three months to even get decided and typically much more because there are often going to be questions about questions and questions about the procedure for answering questions. And so the, the system itself is built not only to make it very difficult for military commission prosecutors to just, you know, produce uh, information that they're being compelled to produce, but even answering the question of what they should produce and whether or not they've produced it and how they'll produce it is something that will invariably take years of litigation to resolve just because you can only ever, quote, get into court, you know, every three months when the caravan can be assembled to send everyone down. All right. So we've had now eight years between the hearing and the sentencing. 
My recollection from the plea was that the sentencing range that Majid Khan received was quite broad, but with an understanding that if he cooperated, he would be sentenced to the low end of it. Walk us through what the plea deal consisted of and what what other than how much of his story and the CIA's story would come out at the hearing was really at stake in this plea hearing that he had a couple weeks ago. So just to make a small correction, there are essentially two aspects of the plea agreement. One is the, the public aspect of the plea agreement, and the other is something that is, at least so far as I'm aware, not fully publicly, has not been publicly disclosed. The public part of the plea agreement was that uh, Mashid Khan agreed to go to the, to the members, to this military jury, with a sentencing range of 25 to 40 years. But the, I don't want to call it a side deal because that makes it sound somehow nefarious. This is incredibly common in military justice practice. But the actual agreement with the convening authority, who is the sort of uber actor in all military commission proceedings, and who negotiates and sets the terms of plea agreements, has some provision for either crediting uh, parts of that sentence or um, giving the commuting authority some leeway to provide for a transfer outside of Guantanamo um, in a shorter period of time than 25 to 40 years from today would suggest. And the understanding was always, I don't know why I keep coming back to the number 18 or something, but the the, the understanding was always that if he cooperated the convening authority would, or that the prosecution would recommend to the convening authority some reduction, right? Yes. So, so the, there is a certain baked in cooperation that is, again, I don't mean to use it as a disparaging term, but it's just a fact is that is part of sort of the secret or side deal with the convening authority had, what was essentially negotiated with the government. And part of that deal, and this is you know, a, a point I'll get, uh, maybe we can get to in a minute. But part of that deal was in in exchange, in essence, for uh, declining to essentially force the government to bring CIA officers to testify at his hearing. Uh, there was some further reduction. That's not public information. It's been reported in the New York Times. Uh, but there was some sort of some form of reduction of the actual sentence uh, that the convening authority agreed to with the cooperation of the government. But then there is totally separately the public aspect of the agreement, which is that he agreed to a sentence of 25 to 40 years, and the military jury was there to essentially give him a sentence in that range. That sounds, it kind of is, frankly, you know, a bit of a bait and switch, I think, for some of the military jurors. And I was reading, there, there was a great article in the New York Times by Carol Rosenberg uh, that actually interviewed the foreman of the jury uh, who sentenced Mr. Khan. And when he kind of found out that there had been this side deal, he was, as you know, military jurors often are when they do discover this, a bit disgruntled by the idea that they were there to just kind of pin a number on the wall officially. But that, that is sort of the, the basic structure of military commi- commission, military justice sentencing generally. And so what was at issue a couple of weeks ago, just to complete the thought, was did Khan deserve the high end of the range or the low end of the range? Um, so it wasn't an, an entirely fruitless exercise, but it was, you know, it wasn't actually a question of 25 to 40 years. So what did the commission, before we get to the substance of what he testified to, what did the commission give him and what can we expect the convening authority to do with it? Yeah, it was, I think, a surprise to a lot of people. With a sentencing range of 25 to 40, the uh, jury came back with 26 years. And again, this is for me based on reporting by Carol Rosenberg, the 26 years was because there was one of the eight members of this military jury, there was one holdout who wanted to um, not give him the absolute minimum sentence. Uh, And so they all compromised to give 26 years, essentially an additional year on top of the minimum so that they could have a unanimous verdict. And he has already basically served 19, right? That's right. Um, so he's already served 19. And so to get a you know 26 year sentence at this point, an additional seven years, if he's given credit for that time, you know, would put him out that would essentially have him serve his sentence in 20, 2028, I guess. But 
we can expect the convening authority under this side deal to lessen it to some degree. What do we expect the convening authority to do? And when do we expect Majid Khan to be free? So that that is again. Um, I, I actually don't have any inside information on that, so I can say say with some confidence that it's not entirely known. But the the reporting, which has been credible so far, suggests that he could be out as early as February of this year, and at, at the very latest, probably the end of the first term of the, of the Biden administration. And though he grew up in Baltimore, he is not a U.S. citizen, so presumably he would be then sent back to Pakistan. Is that I, I think that is the 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 plan, and I don't. Again, the, the, I'm sure there are internal deliberations and discussions about how exactly that's going to unfold. But it's, but I, I'm sure there's something like that. It may not be Pakistan because I do think he may have personal safety issues going back to Pakistan. So there may be some third country that is going to essentially take him. He was born in Saudi Arabia. He's Pakistani, but he's born in Saudi Arabia. And so maybe there is a, uh, a third country. That's a bit of speculation on my part, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't think it unlikely in this situation. It is complicated, though, by the fact that his family are all American citizens now. And so there is a, a real um, you know, question about where the best place for him to go would be. Yeah, and to hear him speak, you would never know he is not American. That's right. He, he, grew, up in, he grew up in Baltimore. He grew up in Baltimore, and he sounds like a kid from the Mid-Atlantic. <laughs> so... Let's talk about what he testified to, because I think the reason that his hearing was as publicized as it was, was as discussed as it was, was not was not that there was an eight year gap between his sentencing and his plea of the sort that fascinates lawfare readers, but uh, maybe doesn't fascinate the New York Times. Uh, it was about what he testified to. So describe it. What is Majid Khan's story? This is, among other things, the first time we have heard a CIA RDI program inmate give a formal statement as to what happened to him. Yeah, it, it really is. It, it's, it's a remarkable statement. And I actually encourage anyone uh, listening to this podcast to actually read it themselves. You can get it, I think, on the Military Commission website or the transcript of it anyway. And it was this, you know, very compelling moment. He, as you said, speaks completely unaccented or minimally accented American English and was able over the course of, I think, over two hours to not only, you know, take, you know, real responsibility for what he did. And his statements about that, you know, were very sincere. People, I'm sure, can debate whether or not they were, but to hear him say it and how he said it and his remorse was palpable. But the the part of his statement that was just, you know, completely new to people's ears was to hear someone who had been subjected to that kind of campaign of torture over a course of years that we've read about, um, that the Senate Intelligence Committee has, you know, written at length about in in with government documentation that you know, people have tried to reenact or describe in movies such as Zero Dark Thirty, but to have someone uh, who could articulate very clearly with showing the scars on his wrists to sort of almost act out certain aspects of what was being done to him just with his body language was an incredibly remarkable, I think, profoundly affecting moment. Because, And, and I say that not simply because of the New York Times' you know, interest in it, but that's what the jury said. The the foreman of the jury uh, gave an interview after the fact, saying that you know he had you know never really been in close proximity with any terrorist before, although he had uh, sunk a pirate ship in, in Somalia, in which uh, a number of you know terrorists were captured or pirates were captured in Somalia, and to sit fifteen feet away from a man who could describe being you know you know, forcibly sodomized with a garden hose. And when he asked the the man who claimed to be a doctor why he was doing it, the guy whispered into his ear, because you're a fucking terrorist. To have someone describe the sensation of being hung for days uh, or forced to stand for days and how the handcuffs 
on your feet begin to bite into your skin because the swelling of your feet becomes so significant that it it cuts against the handcuffs and to the point where your skin begins to peel off like a snake you know the the sense of humiliation and the sense of just degradation and dehumanization i i think to hear that from the person it happened to maybe not eloquently but in a way that could be easily understood and related to was a, a powerful moment. Everyone who saw it describes it that way. And I think it's one of the main reasons, for example, there was a lot of controversy. Um, some lawfare re- uh, listeners and readers might know that Abu Zubaydah, another one of the RDI program detainees, um, has been seeking evidence for a um, prosecution in a foreign country. That case went up to the Supreme Court this past October, and one of the questions posed both to his counsel and the counsel for the government was, well, can't Abu Zubaydah just testify uh, in the proceeding about what happened? And the counsel for the government didn't have an answer right away, but came back with an answer saying, well, we'll let him write a declaration or a letter about it. And that's a big difference, right? It's a big difference. There's a big difference in what you read and what you hear and the reality of it, the immediacy of it. And so I think that's really what made the Majid Khan case, I think, remarkable and surprisingly so. I don't think anyone expected. There wasn't a lot of clamor uh, for people to go down to the Majid Khan hearing. I think it was just the reality of hearing it from someone who who was able to articulate in a way that people could understand what had happened. That just was incredibly affecting and really was a remarkable moment in the history of of these things, which have, as you said, been going on for, you know, 20 years at this point. What do you think is the consequence of this for the other major RDI cases that are going on at Guantanamo. And there's, you know, two biggies. One is the Nashiri case in which you are involved. The other is the the 9-11 case. Both of them involve terrorists, uh, with no offense to your client, terrorist operatives who are much bigger deals than Majid Khan. And both of them also involve conduct in the RDI program that is more extreme than what Majid Khan experienced. So uh, the 9-11 case, for example, involves full-blown waterboarding and I think all of the authorized techniques within the RDI program. The uh, Nashiri case involves some extreme unauthorized techniques, including if memory serves pointing a gun at his head. You'll correct me if I'm misremembering that. But if I were a government prosecutor and I watched a jury look at, and granted, the, the procedural posture is different because Majid Khan is somebody who pleads, cooperates over a long period of time and expresses as you describe, real remorse. He's not, you know, KSM, uh, who's, you know, very, very proud of his handiwork. And he's also not somebody who succeeded in major terrorist operations. So granted, the posture is different. On the other hand, the torturous aspects of it, the circumstances that he's describing are, if anything, comparatively mild next to what some of these other guys were subjected to. And I would think if I were uh, one of the prosecutors in that case, watching the way a military jury responded to Majid Khan would make me very concerned about the, perhaps not the guilt innocence portion of these cases, but certainly the, you know, to the extent the government wants to seek the death penalty, would make me very worried about the death penalty aspects of the case. So I I have to be slightly careful because, as you said, I do, um, I I am uh, an appellate counsel for Al Nashiri. So let's leave Nashiri out of it and just just talk about the the, the 9-11 case. Yeah, and I I think your basic intuition is right. And uh, something I don't think we've mentioned yet is not only did the military jury in the Khan case sentence him to almost the minimum sentence he could have been given, but I think the more remarkable thing that happened was after they gave him that sentence, 
the foreman of the jury with the concurrence of uh, six other members of the jury. So only one not signing on to this letter wrote a really stunning two page letter, a handwritten letter asking for clemency below what they were essentially authorized to, to sentence him to, asking the convening authority to grant clemency to Mr. Khan because of the torture. At one point, the, the letter even says that the torture of Mr. Khan is a stain on the moral fiber of America. It, is, it is, should be the source of shame for the United States government. And for that reason, not only should he be given the leniency that we've attempted to give him, you know, by giving him almost the minimum sentence, but that the convening authority should use the convening authority's exclusive discretion in this area to go even lower. And that's a, you know, for a, a you know, a military jury of all officers, I think the youngest or the, the most junior officer on that jury was a major, all of whom have served virtually their entire, if not their entire careers during the war on terrorism. For them to come to that conclusion so succinctly and so explicitly to go to that and take that extra step to ask for clemency on top of the low sentence they gave him is a remarkable statement about how people who have not been soaking in this, who have not gotten used to thinking about, you know, oh, well, were these authorized techniques or, you know, was the forcible sodomy necessary or justified or, you know, was the use of the gun or in Mr. Nalashiri's case, a drill, you know, is that beyond the express authorization of what was in the torture memo, right? People who aren't soaking in this, who just see it fresh are appalled and rightfully so. And so if I was the prosecutor in any of the Guantanamo cases, particularly the capital cases, I, I would be thinking very long and hard about what the convening authority at the very beginning of the Trump administration actually attempted to do, which was to negotiate plea agreements in the 9-11 case for life sentences, because, you know, in order to get finality, there were lots of good, strong policy reasons to do that. But to get finality, to give the victims of the September 11th attacks the opportunity to have their day in court, uh, to hear perhaps even from some of the uh, alleged plotters of the 9-11 attacks, to hear whether or not they have remorse or at least what happened. I know that's very, you know, that's oftentimes one of the most important things a victim wants to know is what actually happened that led to the, the death of their loved one. And had it not been for then Attorney General Jeff Sessions's rather irate intercession um, at the idea that this death penalty was might be taken off the table in the 9-11 case, we may have already had that day in court. Um, and so if I'm, again, I'm not a prosecutor, I'm not going to tell them how to do their job. But if I were a prosecutor in these cases, I would take this as a reminder that the things that happened to Mr. Khan, the things that happened to Mr. Nashiri and all of the other high value detainees, or many of the other high value detainees, do not sit well with Americans. We do not think of ourselves as a country that engages in torture. Uh, we think of ourselves as a country that created the Geneva Conventions, that fights countries that engage in torture. And so to hear that it's, you know, American, you know, girls and boys, men and women, who are engaging in things that we traditionally associate with North Korea or the Nazis, that is something that is upsetting and it should be. Uh, and I guess part of me is perversely relieved that it is still upsetting to many Americans. And so I, I agree. I think if you were handling the prosecution of these cases, I would, I would take this as a very strong warning that you need to take the mitigation question uh, much more seriously than they certainly have over the past 10 years. So I, I want to ask, I mean, this is a, a bit of a mischievous question, but how much pain would the government really save itself if it allowed such a plea deal? And the reason that I'm asking is that the brutality that these people faced actually doesn't go to their guilt or innocence. All of it post dates by a number of years, the conduct directed at them. And moreover, any statements they made are clearly not going to be used in any event, uh, or at least I assume not. So if you're trying to prove guilt or innocence, it doesn't 
help you that much to say, well, as a defense lawyer, well, you know, my guy, after he did all these incredibly horrible things, was tortured in, in the CIA's program. But if you're the government and you allow him to plead and take the death penalty off the table, one thing the Majid Khan case says is you're still going to have to have eight years of litigation over how much of this stuff they're going to get in in a sentencing hearing, including most affectingly, and I'm sure justifiably, their own testimony about it. You're still going to have to bite the bullet. And so my question is, what is the government like? Look, if I were the chief prosecutor, this these cases would have pled out a long time ago. I don't I don't have a lot of time for the death penalty, and I certainly don't have a lot of time for, you know, dragging this these trials out for 15 years in order to for the marginal justice benefit, if you think of it that way, of the death penalty over life in prison without parole. So I don't have a dog in the in this in the sessions battle here. In fact, I'm very much on the other side of the question. But I'm trying to, like, if you were somebody in the government who is trying to, you know, maximize justice on behalf of the victims, that is, you really believe in the death penalty as the right answer for this question, for these cases, what does it really get you to allow it to plead out if you're still going to have a sentencing hearing in which, you know, maybe they do force all these CIA guys to testify. How much are you really benefiting from the accommodation? One one quick point and then uh, an answer to your question. So I I would actually say it's not clear that the statements that the, the men in the RDI program made are not being used as evidence. In fact, we have a case in Al Nashiri's case um, we have a case in the D.C. Circuit right now because the prosecutors in his case, with the acquiescence of the military judge in his case, have said and used evidence taken in the midst of some of the worst torture uh, that he was subjected to in the RDI program on the ground that they are allowed to use it pre-trial, just not at trial. So even in, for example, discovery litigation, when you determine what evidence uh, the defense will have, or motions in limine in terms of what evidence the jury will ultimately be allowed to hear. The current state of the law, incorrectly in my view, is that the prosecutors can and are and happy to use evidence taken under some of the most extreme and like stunning periods of torture. And so that that remains to be seen. But to your broader point, you know, what do the prosecutors get? Look, if you're if you're Jeff Sessions and you have nothing but a taste for blood. I don't know that there's any anything that you'll see that, that you get if a win to you is solely and exclusively defined as getting a death sentence against the alleged plotters of the September 11th attacks. Um, if that's your position, I, I, you know, I mean, I, I would say there's no reason. But, you know, prosecutors are supposed to think about the interests of justice. They're supposed to think about the needs of victims. They're supposed to think, frankly, about the public interest at any sentencing hearing, whether or not it's in the result of a plea deal or the result of a trial, you're going to have all these same debates. But in a capital context, the burden on the prosecution to permit pretty much the the broadest breadth of discovery and opportunity for a criminal defendant to make the case that their lives should be spared enhances the rights of the defendant to get more of the information, to make a broader presentation, to make the essentially an almost unfettered presentation of why they should not be put to death. So the demands on, if, if your primary concern is protecting classified information, protecting the individuals who are participants in the RDI program, you're at your weakest if it's a capital case. And so you may succeed in the short term, maybe in the military commissions, and maybe you'll be able to keep a lot of that out and you'll have a death penalty phase and the person is sentenced to death without being able to make a fulsome case. You know, if I was a betting man, I'm an appellate lawyer. Appellate appeals are difficult in capital cases. But even Jokar Sarnayev, who was the Boston Marathon bomber, prevailed in the First Circuit Court of Appeals 
on the ground that the government failed to let him make a, a fulsome sentencing case um, after he pled guilty and wanted to essentially raise a particular kind of evidence uh, in his defense in mitigation. And the First Circuit Court of Appeals said, yeah, when death is on the line, you can't put those kinds of constraints on the evidence that a criminal defendant can bring forward. Um, Supreme Court may reverse that in Sarnayev's case, but that gives you a sense about how much risk the government would be taking in pushing these as death penalty cases and trying to both keep all of the secrets that it's trying to keep secret, that it kept, was able to keep secret, actually, in Majid Khan's case, and also trying to seek the death penalty at the same time. I think there's a, there's a very high likelihood that either it'll all come out eventually and they should just bite the bullet now, or if they keep pursuing the death penalty and they are able to withhold that evidence at trial, um, that it's going to get reversed on appeal and they'll have to do it all over again. And I think that's probably the worst possible world we could be in, is another 10 years of the 9-11 case. So to illustrate that risk kind of vividly uh, with respect to jurors as well as judges, I want you to close by reading in its entirety the letter that the military jury uh, sent to the convening authority after hearing this testimony. Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. From panel in the case of United States versus Khan to the convening authority. The panel members listed below recommend clemency in the case of Majid Sukat Khan. Mr. Khan committed serious crimes against the United States and partner nations. He has pled guilty to these crimes and taken responsibility for his actions. Further, he has expressed remorse for the impact on the victims and their families. Clemency is recommended with the following justification. One, Mr. Khan has been held without the basic due process under the United States Constitution. Specifically, he was held without charge or legal representation for nine years until 2012 and held without final sentencing until October 2021. Although designated a, quote, alien unprivileged enemy belligerent and not technically afforded the rights of U.S. citizens, the complete disregard for the foundational concepts upon which the Constitution was founded is an affront to American values and concept of justice. Two, Mr. Khan was subject to physical and psychological abuse well beyond approved enhanced interrogation techniques, instead being closer to torture performed by the most abusive regimes in modern history. This abuse was of no practical value in terms of intelligence or any other tangible benefit to U.S. interests. Instead, it is a stain on the moral fiber of America. The treatment of Mr. Khan in the hands of U.S. personnel should be a source of shame for the United States government. Three, Mr. Khan committed his crimes as a young man reeling from the loss of his mother. A vulnerable target for extremist recruiting, he fell to influences furthering Islamic radical philosophies, just as many others have in recent years. Now at the age of 41, with a daughter he has never seen, he is remorseful and not a threat for future extremism. It is the view of the panel members below that clemency be granted based on the points above, as well as Mr. Khan's continued cooperation with U.S. efforts in other, more critical prosecutions. Panel member number one, number eight, number five, number nine, number 12, number four, and number 11. I want to ask whether this case looks anything like justice to you. On the one hand, you've got a guy who, you know, committed acts for which I think if he were, you know, not held in CIA custody, not tortured, he spends the rest of his life in prison uh, for, you know, conspiracy to kill Pervez Musharraf, conspiracy to help KSM do all kinds of terrible stuff. And we've forgotten about him a long time ago. So in one sense, he is reaping a criminal justice windfall for the abuse that was directed at him. Of course, that windfall in sentencing comes because of incredible abuse directed at him. And so when you look at this case, do you say this is roughly what the right answer is for Majid Khan? Or do you think at the end of the day, there is some other way we should be thinking about the balance of punishment, 
cooperation, remedial acts for his torture. What does justice look like in a case like this? I would resist the idea that this is any kind of windfall. He has spent, you know, his entire adult life in some of the harshest, most brutal conditions that any human being has suffered and should never suffer. And so the idea that because he's not being, you know, hammered to the wall and put in admax for the rest of his life, um, he should be thanking his lucky stars. I, I profoundly disagree with that. But I think, you know, is, is this justice, you know, did they find justice in Guantanamo? I, I, I struggle to say yes, actually. And it's not out of any sort of partisan idea or sort of my general sort of, you know, <laughs> disappointment with the performance of the military commissions over these past 20 years. It's because, you know, justice should be that people feel a sense of closure, that it may not be perfect, but people feel that they know what happened, that they had their day in court, that victims were able to confront the person who was responsible or in part or, or completely or significantly for the loss they suffered, or for the harm they endured. And we didn't have that here. You know, we had a a series of partial agreements and compromises to resolve a case on the best possible terms available. And I guess I just have a bit of anxiety. I, I, I guess I just have a bit of reluctance to say that good enough is justice when lots of other decisions could have been made, lots of other choices could have been made and we wouldn't still hear 20 years plus after September 11th be talking about how and when we'll ever get closure in the war on terrorism. You know, the war in Afghanistan is over. You know, Guantanamo is approaching its 20th year of existence. And I don't think the country has frankly, been able to move on from that. And I think it's had a terrible effect on our, our politics generally, on our, on our culture, on our society. So to say that because in this one case, we had this sort of stunning moment of refreshing moral clarity from the, the jurors who presided over this case because they just saw it with fresh eyes, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it is a landmark moment in the history of these things. But I struggle to I struggle to equate that with justice. And is there is there any additional step that could make this case look like justice to you, or is there just too much water under the bridge that it's it's ultimately the the process is so poisoned, the history is so poisoned that there's no that there's no resolution of it that works. The optimist in me would like to think that I could come up with a good answer to that question. I can't on the fly, unfortunately. And, and again, I'm not, I, I don't have a stake in Majid Khan's case. I've never met him or represented him. And it's not something that I've really had any deep insight or involvement in. And I do worry that we have, you know, there have been windows in which it was possible at the beginning of the Obama administration, later in the Obama administration, there were windows in which we could be on a much more salutary path where I don't think we'd still be talking about any of this stuff had different decisions been made, but we didn't do that. And it's 20 years later, we have an entire generation that has grown up knowing nothing else. And, you know, how, how do you resolve these cases in a way that's just, this is going to sound trite and I'm sure this is not a perfect answer, but I think you do what attorney general Holder said we should have done in 2009, bring them to New York, put them on trial, where the crime happened, let it out, you, you know, and try, stop trying to pretend that all of this stuff is still secret after all, after so many years and let the chips fall where they may. And I think that, I think that's probably the closest we can come to justice at this point in our history, but uh, that's the, the best answer I can give, even if it's an imperfect one. We're going to leave it there. Michelle Paradis, thanks so much for joining us. 
Yeah, thanks for having me on. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode was Hamza Situ of Goat Rodeo. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is, as ever, performed by Sophia Yan. Our promotional engine is you, the listener. So share us on all the socials. And of course, leave a rating or review wherever you found us. You can become a material supporter of Lawfare at our Patreon page. And as always, thanks for listening.